So thanks very much, Henry, for obviously joining me. And um, I have a whole number of questions I'd really like to explore with you today. And I guess, you know, one, one of the first points I'd like to begin with, and I, don't, I know you, you, you know, you get quite embarrassed quite easily, but this is a quote I think I could equally apply to yourself. When you, you once said that Paulo Freire was one of the most important educators of the 20th century. And I guess obviously I owe you, hold you in the same esteem as that. Um, but what did you mean to convey when you said that about Paulo? I, I think in, in, in many ways, you know, Paulo shifted the paradigm around the relationship between education, democracy, and the possibility of basically taking seriously those people, those, those, those students, those workers, those who are considered the oppressed, uh, to be, be able to narrate themselves and to understand education in a way that suggested it was imminently political and not just a method, not just an a priori script that you imposed on people. And so it, it opened up a lot of doors, theoretically, politically, socially, culturally, that in many ways, I think, spoke to my generation of young people. I mean, we were trying to find the language in which education was something more than about teaching for the test or standards or in, engaged in some kind of bureaucratic nightmare of uh, what it meant to basically, you know, define how education worked and what it was for. So, so in that sense, it was like a lightning strike. You know, you, you read certain books and they shift the paradigm. I mean, he wasn't, he went far beyond Dewey. He went far beyond a whole range of liberal ed educators who were far more concerned about individual mobility than they were about social change. And so he, in, in a sense, provided a foundation that was taken up later by a whole range of movements that took it seriously. I mean, the movements in the 60s, the latter part of the 60s, the critical sociology movement in England and the United States, uh, cultural studies, youth studies. I mean, all of these, all of these movements were vastly, in, in many ways, uh, influenced by Paul. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I know obviously we, we've spoke about this at length before, but, you know, I, I think it'd be really interesting for the, the people listening today to, if you can explain a bit about how you, you know, as a teacher, uh, you know, in, in high school, I believe, you know, first encountered the work of Paolo and how you became good friends yourself and how did that process happen? Well, you know, I was a high school teacher for about seven years. That, that was basically my first foray into education and, and 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 at the time you know i was teaching in the 60s and i say this because in many ways public education was a bit more open then than it is now in, in terms of the way it's being defined by teaching for the test or standards or, or you know learning outcomes all this nonsense that basically depoliticizes people and makes them stupid um, and so i had more room in, in a sense to employ progressive methods at that time I was actually using films from the, you know, from the Quakers, you know, <laughs> and using a whole range of books. I, mean, I, I taught Wilhelm Reich's book on the mass psychology of fascism in high school. Think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had seminars. You know, we, we did it in seminar forms with, with a whole range of students, working class kids, kids who, who allegedly were more accelerated. And then one day I got challenged by a vice principal who basically believed that a militarized mind was the only way to really understand education in the rest of the world. And he was a, as offensive as he was aggressive. And uh, he pulled me out of class and he said, why are they sitting like this? And he was very upset, you know. And, I, I, and to be honest, Brad, I, 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 I identified with the experience, but I didn't have a language to basically articulate that in theoretical and political terms. And ironically, I came across very soon uh, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it basically changed my life. I, I mean, it, it gave me a language and it, it helped me to theorize much of what I was doing in ways that could be articulated to others, you know, beyond the simple, I like kids or this, this feels right. Uh, you know, it, it was, I was no longer collapsing the political and the theoretical simply into the personal. And that was very important. Mm -hmm. Soon afterwards, I wrote to Paul. Uh, I did a review, actually, sorry. I, I did a review of one of his books and he wrote to me. He sent me a letter that uh, said, I love this piece, it, it, you know, and so forth. So I was just so overwhelmed. I mean, I, mean you know, I was an assistant professor my first year at Boston University, and I get a letter from Paolo Freire. And we began a conversation. And from there, um, I met Paolo in 1980s when he was about to go back to Brazil after eight, six, 18 years in, in exile. Mm -hmm. And we developed a long friendship. We developed a book series together, as you well know.
mm-hmm. on cultural studies, on culture and pedagogy. And uh, we published about 86 people, many of whom didn't have tenure. Mm-hmm. And were trying to get tenure and couldn't get published. And yet their work was brilliant, but they were, you know, they were ostracized because they were a little too left for the established uh, publishers. Mm-hmm. Well, what would you describe that as <laughs> almost replicated in, in the world we live in, in today? You know, there's, there's kind of no progress there. And I'm kind of thinking, you know, the shift from Paolo's book to, you know, I, I was, you know, very fortunate to be invited to write the foreword to your latest book on pedagogy of resistance. And you kind of think, well, what's really changed, right, since that book comes out and your latest book comes out? And it seems that the struggles that you're identifying there are almost exactly the same struggles that we're facing today. I, I think that I, I think that actually they're they're worse today. Uh, I, I I think the regression that has taken place with the collapse of neoliberalism and liberal democracy, and the collapse of civic culture, has so militarized this culture in the interest of, of a kind of burgeoning fascism um, that one of the things that we've seen is an attack on education, unlike I think anything I have seen in 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 you know in my lifetime. Um, the banning of books, uh, the, the, the claiming that uh, historical consciousness doesn't matter, the, the embrace of a rabid kind of anti-intellectualism, the, the move towards methods in a post-pandemic world. You and I have talked about this, where technology now has taken over, in many ways, the educational process. Let's all have a meeting and talk about Zoom all day and how it works, never mind the alienation it, it, it uh, produces in, in young people. Um, and, I, and I think that in, in many ways, the power now has become so much more concentrated in the hands of the right because they, they're implementing policies that are so powerful that I don't think Paolo's work has ever been more important than it is now. Because he not only understands, he not only understood school as a site of struggle, he understood that in some fundamental way that questions of consciousness and questions of literacy uh, were fundamental to notions of agency in which young people had to learn something about the conditions that dominated their lives. And in doing that, that was the first step to not only recognizing those conditions, but recognizing the limit situations imposed on them. Mm-hmm. And so it, 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 it seems to me that that was the first step in re- being able to gear a pedagogy that was really a social theory, a project, mm-hmm. uh, that was really about domination and how to recognize it within the educational process and within not only institutional schooling, but also in other areas, and how to, how, where that went in, in terms of being able to fashion, and this is very crucial, people who are both informed and critical and at the same time engaged. He, didn't, he wasn't just talking about literacy as a form of critical thinking. He was talking about literacy as a form of praxis, you know, as a form of critical consciousness. You know, one, one conscientization, as, as he put it, meaning that you link what you knew to what it meant to actually intervene in the world. That's why those people who have argued that Paulo Freire's work is a, is a methodology are completely wrong. It's not a methodology because it's concerned with questions of justice and power and agency. It's concerned with how knowledge is linked in some way to the conditions of one's, to the conditions of labor. It's concerned with what it means to produce uh, people who know how to desire and imagine the future in a particular way. But it's also concerned with the acquisition of agency and the struggle over agency. So he combined the symbolic and the material in ways that sort of, how can I say this, merged Reich, Wilhelm Reich, Freud and Eric Fromm with others in developing the notion of freedom in which questions of education were central to politics. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I wanna come back to this in a moment, Henry, because you know, I think one of the things which I've you know, been taken always by your work is how education is central to politics. And in question, especially, and I want to return back to this question of consciousness as well. But uh, before we go on to that, is there a particular quote from the pedagogy of the press that really stands out for you? Is there a particular section that you find? Well, there's a quote that I like that is, is to go back to your original question, you know, as a high school teacher, really moved me. Um, and, I, and I'll read it to you, and, I, and, I, it, and it's, it's one of my favorite quotes from Paolo. He says, he says, I'm a teacher who stands up for what is right against what is indecent, who is in favor of freedom against authoritarianism, who is a supporter of authority against freedom with no limits, and who is a defender of democracy against the dictatorship of the right. I'm a teacher who favors the permanent struggle over every form of bigotry and against the economic determinism of individuals and social classes. I'm a teacher who rejects the present system of capitalism, responsible for the aberration of misery 
in the midst of plenty. I'm a teacher who is full of the spirit of hope in spite of all the signs to the contrary. I'm a teacher who refuses the disillusionment that consumes and immobilizes. I'm a teacher proud of the beauty of my teaching uh, practice, a fragile beauty that may disappear if I do not care for the struggle and knowledge that I ought to teach. If I do not struggle for the material conditions which my body, which my body will suffer from neglect, thus running the risk of becoming frustrated and ineffective, then I will no longer be the witness that I ought to be, no longer the tenacious fighter who may tire, but who never gives up. I mean, I love that quote. I, I mean, I, I mean, the, the, the quote is, is, is so humble and yet moving. I mean, it combines the politics of critique with the politics of hope with a very expansive notion of freedom. Freedom is not just about political and personal rights. It's also about economic rights. Mm -hmm. We don't have the material conditions in which to exercise a sense of agency, then rights disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're impoverished, as most people are in, in this neoliberal fascism that dominates the globe now, how do you think about voting when you, you can't even provide food for your children or for your family or for yourself or health care or any of the basic social provisions that make life basically worth living in some ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I th the, the three points which really come out of that, Henry, and, and, I, and again, I sense, you know, the, I know there are three points which are really integral to, you know, all the, you know, the wonderful books that you've produced is, you know, the, in terms of this question of, you know, what does it mean to be an ethical witness to history? And there's three points in there, which you raise in that quote, which I think, as you've just mentioned, again, you know, it's the question of capitalism or what we now call neoliberalism yeah. today. What does a pedagogy of hope look like in the face of that? And how does that really enrich material conditions? You know, and those are the three points which I've always found completely central to the project that you have been developing. You know, it's, and I'm wondering whether you can elaborate a bit more on that kind of connection between capitalism, hope, and the materiality of the lived condition for humans today. Well, I, I mean, I, I think in many ways, capitalism is wedded not to hope, but the despair and cynicism and functions in a way through those processes to utterly depoliticize people. I mean, capitalism operates off the assumption that the only problems that exist are basically individual problems. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, it, it basically concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a financial elite who spread misery all over the globe, including destroying the planet. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that what hope does in the sense that Powell talks about it is he, he talks about understanding the limits of the situation in which we're in. And what that suggests is that history is not, not determined, it's conditioned, and that we're agents, and that we live in a world that's unfinished. And as a result of that, we have to think very carefully about what our roles are to basically imagine a world that isn't marked by despair, that isn't marked by poverty, that isn't marked by massive degrees of inequality, that isn't marked by sexism, an attack on trans people, uh, an attack on anybody who, who's not a white supremacist or a white nationalist these days. And I think that in this sense, you, you begin to understand two things. One, that hope is an educational process, that you have to move people away from a sense of cynicism, which really depoliticizes them. Secondly, you have to recognize that neoliberalism basically normalizes itself by saying that hope doesn't exist, that everything is basically hopeless and there's no alternatives. And thirdly, I, I think in fun, some fundamental way, and this is the most important for me, hope is not only an educational practice that has to be employed, it's not about simply individual salvation, it's about social change and collective struggle. This is, this is what somebody else, another philosopher has called social hope. You know, not, not simply the, the kind of hope that you associate with, with Disney or with neoliberal notions of meritocracy, that's all nonsense. Uh, I mean, it, it, so it, it seems to me that in, in that way, you know, hope sort of focuses on the contradictions that exist in a society that separates people, makes them disappear, dehumanizes them, and raises fundamental questions about what the conditions are that do that, how they, they can be addressed, and what it means to address them collectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to then link this, you know, this question of also about the question of consciousness and to me when we talk about consciousness and you know you, we've met, you mentioned this before that one of the things you thought was overlooked sometimes in Paolo's work is the importance of consciousness and I'm wondering how this connects to your idea of the radical imagination 
And um, I think one of the things that's been often you know, said about what one of the crises of contemporary politics is a crisis of the imagination. And I'm wondering how you see that in terms of how might we consciousness work better in terms of liberating the imagination in a more radical way, as you understand it? I think that that notion of liberation begins with the notion that we live in a world that's social and interconnected, and that you can't separate that notion of the social from matters of economic and social justice on a global scale. And I, and I, I, I think that the, the, this question of consciousness which is often downplayed because I think the left is really utterly guilty in some ways of not making education central to politics and believing that domination is generally simply about institutional and economic structures and nothing else. You know, there's very little concern with how the individual basically is rooted in a way in which he or she can learn to understand, maybe through a different language, both the conditions under which they live and what it might mean to take charge of those conditions. You know, I, I, I mean, domination is not just economic, it's also pedagogical. It's also rooted in questions of persuasion and belief and education. And I think until we begin to understand that, you know, you can't attack a problem until you can understand it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, this question of consciousness is now part of an educational ecosystem, so to speak. That's not just simply about institutional schooling. Mm -hmm. I mean, education now is a massive phenomenon, as C. Wright Mills, Gramsci, you know, uh, Zygmunt Bauman, you, and others have been pointing out for a long time, rooted in a whole range of cultural apparatuses that mm -hmm. basically are about colonizing consciousness. It's not just simply about consumerism and turning the obligations of citizenship simply into an act of consuming. It's about making people feel as if they don't count. It's about making people feel that they should disappear. It's about expanding, uh, it, it seems to me, the, nature's, the notion, notion of oppression to include far more groups than simply the working class. And I, and I think that that's one of the things that Powell really understood. He understood that agency was central to politics. Modes of identification was central to politics. But maybe most importantly, that education was central to politics because we had to be able to understand, work with, teach, and side by side, organize with people for whom they could recognize what we were talking about and learn in terms of the lives that they led. So we had to become learners and not just teachers. You know, we had to work with people, not work on them. And I think this business of working with that rather than working on opens up a pedagogical space that's protective, that's, that's fluid, that's safe, uh, and profoundly uh, radical. Because remember, it, it, for, for Paolo, hope was a function of what he called, as well as education, radical futurity, mm -hmm. a means to imagine something different. And I think that to go back to your question, I'm sorry this has been so long, but to go back to your question about the imagination, I want to talk about the civic imagination and the public imagination and how that gets undermined, how the question of shared values gets reduced to privatized values, how the question of hope gets reduced to individual salvation. And when that happens, civic society begins to collapse. The public imagination is no longer a radical imagination. It's a privatized imagination. It's a gated imagination. At the same time, if you don't have institutions that are public that open the space for all of us as intellectuals, as workers, as cultural workers, as artists, as workers in general, to be able to, in some way, share our vision of a future in which humanity is lifted and expanded, something tragic happens. And what, what happens that's tragic is despair and death take over. Mm -hmm. And they take over in the form of fascism which is rooted basically in hate, in greed, in bigotry, and notions of whiteness that really resemble something that we have seen in the United States, starting with slavery, and of course manifested itself in Nazi Germany and, and Pinochet's regime, mm -hmm. among others. Yeah, well, I wanna connect this also to the history of Latin America, because you know, I recently watched this documentary on Margaret Thatcher, and the one thing that became very clear with Thatcher was, you know, she understood the pedagogy mattered, right? Ideas mattered for Thatcher, right? She, yes, yes. If you're going to be taught, you would be taught Hayek, you'd be taught Friedman. Yeah. Taught Hayek, Hayek got it. He got yeah. that. You know, and, and I think, but I'm thinking then in terms of, you know, you know, obviously with her connection with Pinochet is in, in, in itself is very interesting. Uh, you know, if you want to understand the violence of capitalism, of course, it starts in an authoritarian regime and that right. neoliberal guys. But I want to connect this more to the contemporary moment. And particularly, you know, I know what you've, you've already said about um what you understand the attack on critical race theory has been, and actually part of a broader attack on 
critical pedagogy more generally. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering how this especially also connects to what's happening in Brazil, which I know you've right. also said, is an, what's happening there is an attack on the legacy of Paulo. And I'm right. wondering whether you can elaborate more on that. No, right, right. I mean, I, I, I want to begin by, by pointing to two references here. One is, you know, the recent comparison between what happened in Brazil and what happened in January 6th. It is it's certainly worthwhile. But isn't it interesting that nobody talks about the fact that Bolsonaro's attack on education and Paulo and critical pedagogy in general is not unlike what is also happening in the United States. So that, that whole attack on the on, on consciousness and the possibility of people engaging in forms of pedagogy that are empowering sort of gets written right out of the script of comparisons, right? In some fundamental way. And I, and I think, uh, you know, for, for, for many people who don't really understand this, uh, is that Paulo's pedagogy was really for the subaltern. It was for the global south, right? I mean, that's where it really takes takes hold. And, and, and in many ways, by not understanding that, we lose in some fundamental way, you know, what it means to talk about education and, and hope that is rooted in a notion of the imagination that's collective and global. Mm -hmm. Global. Mm -hmm. I mean, because what Paulo understood immensely near the end of his life was that neoliberalism was 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 a poison and and that you had, democracy and capitalism were not the same thing and that if you were really going to talk about enriching the public and civic imagination you had to begin there that, that we, he, he was not talking about education in the interest of reform he was mm -hmm. talking about in, in education in the interest of radical transformation like Martin Luther King was and he also understood that many of these problems that we talk about, these various forms of oppression, they intersected. Mm -hmm. You know, they mutually reinformed each other. He was looking to link education politically to a larger narrative. And that narrative was socialism, mm -hmm. just as Martin Luther King was trying to do. And that often gets completely written out of his, out of his script. But there's a third thing, uh, Brad, that I think we're both well aware of. I find it interesting that the attacks on critical pedagogy now are very similar to the attacks that Bolsonaro and the language he used, that critical pedagogy is a form of communism, that you know this is all Marxist dribble, right? That it's really about indoctrination. Can you imagine the people who are banning books and forcing teachers to sign loyalty oaths are talking about how education is neutral and how people who are progressives are on the left are promoting and uh, indoctrinating people by trying to make them more critical and make them active, involved citizens who believe that any radical democracy doesn't exist without an informed citizen. I mean, the contradiction is so overwhelming uh, that it's really hard to believe. You know, somebody has said, well, what's the difference between optimism and hope? Well, hope is geared towards not only a collective struggle, it's geared towards radical uh, transformation and not reform. Optimism is, you know, okay, but it usually is, it, it sort of sides often in my, my, my terms on the side of Disney and on the side of individual kinds of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. movements. Yeah, well, and also, Henry, I, in terms of picking this up, and I think, you know, one of the things I said, which I, I've always really admired with your work is, you know, you taken Paolo's work and you've not only applied it to an, an entirely new historical conjuncture, but also you've taken it in far more, you know, in different directions and applied it to different, you know, circumstances. And I'm, I'm interested in basically, you know, this, this question around instrumentalization of education and yeah. the dangers of that kind of, you know, that instrumentalizing logic, which we see more and more, again, accelerating in the, you know, the education is just for jobs and there's that purely instrumental value to it, but also the speeding up through technology now that, you know, that everything has to be imminent and immediate and quick and how that is countered intuitive to the very kinds of rigor which critical pedagogy requires and I wonder you know one thing I've always been you know in a, a complete admiration of your work is the attention to rigor and detail and I'm wondering whether you can maybe offer a few comments and also advice maybe for people who are just beginning with critical pedagogy about the importance of rigor and you know and, and against that instrumentalizing logic. I mean I, I think the last thing that we want to do is confuse what we do those of us who are engaged in an, what allegedly might be called an empowering project of, of critical pedagogy with the kind of instrumentalization that reduces pedagogy to questions of method, to methods of sterile pragmatism, to a kind of utterly barren reductionism. And basically in doing that eliminates questions of power, questions of justice, questions of hope, uh, mm -hmm. questions of emancipation and questions of freedom. Mm 
I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you and I share a certain position with Sigmund Bauman, you know, who wrote about instrumentalization in a way that far exceeds traditional works on the culture of positivism or on, on the politics of empiricism. I mean, this kind of technological rationality leads to the camps. Mm -hmm. It leads to the camp. I, I don't want to be too, uh, you know, uh, uh, pessimistic here, but it seems to me that as soon as you divorce educational theories, edu economic practices, social policies, from questions of social cost, then you create a terrain in which questions of ethical, the ethical grammar of justice and social responsibility begin to disappear. And all of a sudden, you don't have a language any longer for understanding how deeply uh, uh, repressive and dogmatic this instrument, in, instrumental, in, in, this, this, ra irrash, this technocratic rationality actually is. This instrumentalism, it objectifies, it dehumanizes, it erases the voices of difference, and it makes justice look as something that's irreparably old and nostalgic because it can't be measured. And so it seems to me, this is a, once again, a very dangerous moment that has echoes of a past that Adorno and Horkheimer and Marcuse nailed. And we shouldn't have to repeat this, but we certainly shouldn't have to repeat this in one of the most important civic education, you know, civic institutions in the world, which is public and higher education. That's the last place that should be instrumentalized in the manner of the corporations in the manner of global capitalism, in the manner of the financial elite, in the manner of neoliberal fascism. It seems to me it's a very dangerous move that eliminates an important public good from in some way offering both a critique and a sense of possibility for educating generations of people to be able to see beyond it and to question it. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> As always, Henry, it's just amazingly enlightening speaking with you. And I'm mindful that time has kind of run out already before we get on to questions. But there's one final question I think I'd like to ask you. Um, and before we go open up to other uh, questions, and if you could have, have one more conversation with Paolo, what topic would it be with him about today? Wow. <laughs> That's, that's what, what I have talked about today. You know, I, I, I think that what I would have been concerned about is how in an age in which power and the new technologies uh, have merged to create social formations pedagogically, unlike anything we had ever imagined before. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this question of the media and its sort of technological advances have really created a generation in, in, in many ways of young people who are not only tied to an image-based pedagogy, but are also tied to a culture of immediacy and privatization. And I recognize that there are all kinds of groups that use that technology in fundamental ways to offer modes of resistance and to connect with each other. But I think as a dominant paradigm, none of us could have imagined what it would have helped to put in place in terms of the dangers we're facing today. I would also like to have known what it would have meant to be able to talk to each other and to create an international movement for the preservation of public goods and socialist democracy. I think that in that gener our generation was too tied in, in some ways to national boundaries. We, we, we still hadn't figured out the importance of the fact that power had become global while politics had become local. You know, that the global elite now don't care about nation states, they just care about profits. And I don't think we had anticipated enough the potential of the destruction of the planet and what that meant. Um, and I, 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 it would have been interesting to all of a sudden sit down and begin to bring uh, people together from a variety of groups and to be able to make education central to the politics and what it meant. My friend Stanley Aronowitz started to do that before he died. He had an enormous number of insights about what that meant. Uh, but many, much of that generation has passed, you know, and, it, and it, uh, it's sad because we don't have a comprehensive politics anymore in the way we had with the Frankfurt School, the way we had with Paolo. I think the way we had with many of us who are, you know, who are older, who have been working in this field for a long time. I don't believe in fractured politics. I think mm -hmm. it's deadly. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that uh, there has to be a way, Paolo used to talk about unity and diversity, something that Angela Davis and others have been talking about for years. That needs to be rethought. 
in light of the most impending dangers that we face today. 